So, welcome everybody. Let's get started. And uh, there are high expectations on this uh, presentation. Maybe it's been the, the title, uh, a little bit ambitious. Also because, uh, well, maybe you'll be disappointed, but I'm not going to talk about your future, not in the way maybe you think about. I'm, I have no crystal ball, you know, I'm not a magician, and uh, after all, it wouldn't be fun. The future is yours. So what I would try to go through is to some little, say, advices, some tips and some information. So let's start from the present. And what is your present? The present is the school you are, and you know what the school philosophy is? The school philosophy is one of research. The number one uh, item in this school is research. High quality and advanced and original research. Of course, through research you learn, you learn techniques, methods, theories, and everything. But the main uh, advice, number one, so you can count the four advices I'm going to give you, descends uh, strictly from uh, this motto, which is the motto of the school. Uh, this is taken from Seneca, the famous uh, uh, Latin uh, poet and philosopher, that you see, never be afraid to waste time <coughs> to learn for yourself, which is something extremely fundamental for a young scientist. You're not wasting your time. You're not just uh, here for, uh, uh, say, learning, but for learning for yourself, which is different. And uh, from all of this, it descend, uh, as I say, the suggested number one, which is uh, what goes along with the so-called publish or peerish uh, philosophy. That means get a rich and qualified scientific production. If you don't have anything in your curriculum at the end of this school, you will be in trouble. You will be in trouble demonstrating what you know, what you can do. So the first thing to do is to be uh, strictly productive and, and uh, filling your curriculum with uh, high quality research results articles, books, whatever, patents and presentations and everything. So this is advice number one and I think it's an important one. The second one is something that sometimes is uh, a little bit overlooked uh, and uh, uh, apparently because uh, it seems always you don't have time for anything, nobody has time nowadays, but sometimes also because you are a little bit ill uh, advised uh, and I'm, I'm blaming myself first, you should be push to, to increase your visibility, like, for example, you know, making your own page on, on uh, Google Scholar, but why not? Scopus and Web of Science, these two things, especially in Italy, have a legal value. You'll see that uh, the habilitation process to become professor goes through what these two things, Scopus and Web of Science, say about you. So it is official, it's not just uh, for fun. And then create your uh, or kid, that uh, is the name I always pronounce, or kid, is a, a code that, it's a sort of identification code that appears on all what you make and uh, is an identifier. In fact, it comes from the word identifier. And it costs nothing. So take one of these and uh, you will be related to whatever you make in the, your life to that number. It's important. More on these, why not go a little bit social? I'm not very social in my life. <laughs> I am proud to say I know nothing about Facebook and things like this, but the research is different. <coughs> Through these things, you can uh, learn of uh, job opportunities. They advertise on uh, ResearchGate, and you can uh, append all your publications so that you don't even need to send them around. People <coughs> can just pick them up from here freely, so do that. And then finally, go participate in conferences. One of the things is what to do at conferences. Most of you tend to be shy. And that's one, this is as fatal as having an empty CV. Don't be shy. You, you, you cannot afford being <coughs> shy as a scientist. This is totally against you. So shyness is, is to be excluded. So don't be shy, ask for aura. Just go on, sh on, on stage and speak up to the audience your ideas. And don't worry, <coughs> especially as far as you're young, you have very little to lose, believe me. Even if you say something wrong, who cares? You just go. People will remember of you. So this is the little advice I'm giving you about uh, 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 advice number two. But now let's talk about the future and uh, a little bit of, uh, let's say, statistical future. What and where to do. One or two things you might like to go to read through is what Alma Laurea and Istat, which are two, uh, say, authorities for statistical uh, things. Istat is for general statistics of Italy. Alma Laurea is specialized on university. Uh, I will 
put these two reports on the on the website, but you can easily find them. And what do they say about uh, perspectives for PhD students? This is quite good for engineering. The employment rate after one year is 87%, which is way above that of a master's degree. And uh, two thirds of this 87% uh, have a, what we would say a regular job. What is it not regular? It means that they are still through some kind of training and education. But two thirds are definitely in a regular job that you see, contrary to what most people think, is in most part in private companies. Maybe not working exactly at what you've learned on a PhD, but you, you, <coughs> these are the numbers. And finally, what is the salary? The salary for a PhD engineer are in the order of 16 to 17 thousand euros. This is Italy, you know, so it's a country that runs on low budgets. So if you go abroad, easily this could go up for five or six or 1,000 euros more. And this is about 500 euros more than what you would earn in the same field just with your master's degree. <coughs> so definitely it, it seems to be a good thing and apply it abroad. Apparently people say that everybody is, you know, the, the brains are leaving Italy. Maybe this is true, maybe <coughs> not. I honestly don't know. I know that for the PhD, this is only true for 14%, which is still not legal, but that's it. Final number, uh, I stop with numbers, uh, enough number. What is the effectiveness of the PhD? Apparently, of the interviews given by ISTA, <coughs> uh, 32 people say that the, the PhD was absolutely required for their job. So without the, the PhD, they could have not had the position. Whereas for four, 52, I mean plus 52, so it's not, 52 is not including the 32, they say that PhD was useful which is also quite important. It's only a 6% of people who say, oh, if I could, I would never go, if I could come back, I mean, I would never go through the PhD again. So just few people regret it. Okay, so, good news. Eh? So now, <laughs> life after PhD, where? If you need to go where, you need to, if you, you need to think where, you need to know things. And one thing you need to see is what are the academic ranks the academic system is extremely complicated around the world. Roughly speaking, you can divide the world in two. The, let's say, Commonwealth, British, USA system, and, let's say, rest of Europe system, with differences, of course. But these are the two main blocks. Read this uh, website, you'll see all the rules of the different countries around the world. Um, as I say, <coughs> as in, these are two blocks. And uh, let's start from Italy. And this is going to be complicated and very Italian, by the way. So for those of you who are not Italian, maybe you want to think of something more amusing because this is really cumbersome. It's the most complicated country in the world. So at the moment, our tenured position go from ricercatore confermato, <coughs> assistant professor, associate professor, ordinary professor, who would be full, actually distinguished professor, would be more uh, correct. And recently, it has been added these two levels of uh, 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 contract uh, um, uh, researcher. I'm going to tell uh, more. And then the postdoc. So usually, you start as a postdoc, and then you go through all the rest. But things more complicated than this. First of all, six, uh, seven years ago, the uh, assistant professor has been turned off. Complicated political issue, but it doesn't exist anymore in the Italian ranking. Italian ranking now only as associate and, and full, let's say, distinguished professor. And uh, the postdoc cannot be longer than six years, and in Trento, four years. Is, uh, at the moment, is uh, four years. RTD stands for Ricercatore a Tempo Determinato. That means contract position, but the difference is important. A is non tenure You go away after the end of the B means that there is a tenured track, tenure track. It means there will be a position that you might win at the end of a three years uh, time. So typically the RTDA can run for three years plus two years only, whereas to become associate professor, you need to go through an RTDB <coughs> of three years. And to enter the, the three years RTDB, there are some constraints. So this system is probably violating statics, but 
it is full of constraints and uh, you see that no more 12 years of contract overall and you can only enter and even uh, compete for entering an RTD position if you have made three years of previous experience uh, on uh, postdoc or RTDA. That means that roughly you need in the best scenario about 12 years to become professor which is dangerously becoming closer and closer to pension. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay, this is complicated. You want to go over all these uh, afterwards, but uh, let me <coughs> add one step. To become professor, on top of all of these, you need an habilitation. Now, habilitation is something that was uh, existing in Italy in the 70s. Then it was uh, turned around, and then uh, it remained in France and in Germany, which is a very well-established uh, uh, procedure. You don't have it in UK and the USA. That's uh, the main difference between the two systems. So what is it about habilitation? Habilitation is run by this ASN, which is uh, some kind of state organization, ministry organization. They pick up uh, professors uh, like us here, and uh, you need to have some ranking, otherwise you cannot be accepted as uh, a member of the commission uh, awarding the habilitation. So there is a process behind this, but this is the example of the threshold productivity values you must uh, 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 pass to, to be admitted to the habilitation. It does mean that you are automatically habilitated, but this is the, uh, uh, um, necessary. It's not sufficient, but it's necessary. So look at, for example, hydraulics, which is one of the most popular areas here. You see that this is the, sorry, oh, I need something wrong, okay. This is uh, the so-called famous or infamous IH index in 10 years, five. You need to have 130 citations and uh, at least uh, uh, five uh, articles on Scopus or Web of Science. That's why I told you it's so important. But if you change the, the, the field like uh, uh, mechanics, uh, you see that the thresholds are these, slightly lower. And then there are other fields <coughs> which are more competitive, like mine. I'm happy I'm going through all the old levels, mm -hmm. but it's becoming more and more challenging. You see that the numbers are about double. Uh, this has to do with a lot of political and things. And, uh, but however, if you don't have these numbers, you cannot even apply for the habilitation. And if you fail the habilitation, you have to wait two turns to make it again. So it's something you don't want to make just to try every time. But it must be very, very careful. If you don't get the habilitation when you are RTDB, then you finish your three years and you will never become a professor. So it's really full of uh, uh, problems all this. So let me summarize this. After three, four years PhD, you have postdoc options. You can make postdoc up to 12 years, no more than this. One of the options is the Assegno di Ricerca, the postdoc which is paid about from uh, 15 to 2,000 euros per month. Roughly, the most easy is 1,600. And in Trento, it's four years. Or you might be hired as a, a, a researcher, but type A for three years, more or less same pay, but in that case, you have more social security. The Assegno di Ricerca doesn't cover uh, holidays, doesn't cover the 13th uh, salary, doesn't cover assistance, lot of things. but. Uh, however, and then after this, at least three years spent in one of these things, you can try an RTDB. And after these three years, if you get an habilitation at the same time, uh, if you are still alive after all of these, you can become a, an associate. <laughs> That's it. That's Italy. Nice. Italy, nothing is easy, nothing is simple in Italy. So let's have a look at another country, different country. Uh, as I said, I will give you these slides, don't worry. And please, if you find mistakes, uh, Ricardo, everybody, <coughs> because uh, maybe I didn't get all the these dates right. So what is it in UK? UK, you see that they start from a lecturer, which is the entry level, and uh, 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 skip the assistant, the demonstrator. These are just uh, temporary position, contract positions. There is a jungle eh, in the UK of the, all these things. Lecturer is what we would call assistant professor. Then you become senior lecturer, which is equivalent to an associate professor in the USA, but not in Italy. The equivalent in, in Italy of associate is reader. 
Reader in UK is really an associate professor, whereas the chair, professor chair, which is the distinguished professor in the USA, is the Italian professor ordinario. Just to show you a little bit more, oh well, by the way, they also have a parallel careers, just in research, just in teaching, so, but let me stay just in research and teaching, which is more equivalent to Italian university. So this is a correspondence table I integrated from Wikipedia, but I added the information uh, from, let's say, the Commonwealth system, UK and related countries, the American system, as you see, and the, the German and Italian. German and Italian are quite similar, if not for the fact that in Italy we don't have any more the assistant professor as a permanent role. It's only temporary. His contract can be type A or type B, but it only lasts three or five years. Mm -hmm. And then you must become professor or you go doing something else. Okay, so what about the career in the UK? I've told you all the complicated rules in Italy. Now look at the UK. To become lecturer, that would be the equivalent of the assistant in Italy somehow. Well, in all cases, you have a three to five years probation period. In Italy, there is no much probation. Actually, yes, but it's not the serious point. <coughs> the serious issue is not the probation. So basically, they are watching you for those three, four, eight, five years, if you're good or not. After that, you have an habilitation, but the habilitation is given by a panel commission, not just because of numbers. There are real people judging what you do. And uh, um, during this time, you also allocated a mentor as several tutors. So there are people helping you to do things better. So if you're not a good teacher, someone will help you to become a good teacher, for example. In Italy, we have nothing like this. Probation is not always passed. I know people who didn't pass the probation and went to change a job. Because it happens, they don't uh, make it just for you know, uh, uh, the pleasure of it. It's a serious step in the career. It's probably the most serious thing is to pass the probation. And once uh, uh, you, you have uh, passed the probation, then you really enter the career. To, be, to pass the probation, you must at least have one grant proposal approved. You must demonstrate you can conceive a, a research problem, proje project, and have it financed which is also important, and typically they look only for few but possibly outstanding papers. They don't care that you have uh, so many papers or citations. They look at the best, usually five papers you produce. So it's a system which is much more, say, uh, Protestant, whereas the Italian system is much more Catholic. You know, this is the, <laughs> the big distinction when you cross the Alps. Okay, this is an handbook. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Bob Chernick from the School of uh, Materials in Manchester, uh, sent me. I will uh, add also this. This is just a, the handbook. How to become professor. <coughs> of course, you, you don't have anything like this in Italy. Also because rules in Italy are changing every other day. So, so now, last part of my talk. Life in research, as I say. The first two advice I gave you, fill up your CV with a rich and qualified scientific production, increase <coughs> your visibility. Third point, strong will. Strong will, that's probably the most fundamental one. Don't let anybody to belittle you and also to undermine you. Now, about belittling people, I will uh, mention immediately something which is very new, something which is also upsetting. Uh, okay, 2018, talking this year, do you know this man, Alessandro Strumia? Oh, this guy, came up with the theory at uh, the CERN, by the way, not any place, saying that basically uh, women are accessories to research, that research is made by men, and he sort of demonstrated that. Of course, as you say, former scientists at IFN and the CERN was, was immediately fired. <laughs> also because the boss of the CERN is a, is a lady, by the way. So I mean, this guy is, is out of his head. But now, I am a scientist. So I'm not discussing now too much of the theory. So I will give you experimental evidence. And this is the, <laughs> the evidence I'm giving you. Francis Arnold is uh, uh, the, the colleague who got uh, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for directed evolution, which is a sort of magic that is uh, 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 training enzymes to, to become different and to do better work as a catalyst. It's a huge discovery. And this lady I like to mention, Francis uh, was a former um, engineer, 
mechanical and aerospace engineer. And that was where a little bit our life crossed for a short while because she was making research on solar energy. But this was uh, in the 80s. Uh, uh, she's a bit older than, than me, but not much, she was three, three years older. And uh, she changed completely from engineering into uh, uh, biochemistry. So this is also to tell you the message, do whatever you like in your life. <coughs> you don't need to be uh, faithful to a choice. So you might start in a way and finish a completely different way. She survived cancer. She survived two husbands, which is not little. But <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's a great person. The other one is uh, uh, Donna Strickland. And uh, she contributed uh, to produce new uh, lasers, which are those used in surgery. If we can make surgery nowadays, like eye surgery, it's just because of the invention of Donna and the, the other two guys who got the prize with her. Now, to conclude with the, the belittle and undermining things, let me show a short movie. It's a 10 minutes movie, but you will like it. Uh, I have no way to shorten it. Probably part of it is too, very elementary, but please look at this. This is the clash between two incredible scientists. One of them is Dan. Dan Shetman is a, a, a colleague, a, a, I remember in conferences and places in the early and the late 80s, and he got the Nobel Prize of, on 2011, quite of a surprise, because of the discovery of quasi-crystal. Now, this quasi-crystal in this short movie, it will be explained what is it, if you don't know it, was totally opposed by another guy, which in the United States is an institution. The name is Linus Pauli. Linus Pauli is kind of a god. Two Nobel Prize. One was not enough for him. One was in chemistry, and the second one was in peace, because he sort of uh, blocked the nuclear uh, uh, um, danger in the, in, the, in the late 50s and 60s, that the world was going to explode. And the Linus Pauli was one of those who really did something important, relevant. And so two Nobel Prizes, but he was fiercely against the concept of quasi-crystal. And uh, look at the. The, the movie now. I, I hope it goes through nice. The movie will start explaining something very simple to you. <laughs> no problem. The first part, as I say, is Matter is our world. Our world is, is matter. It's constructed of atoms that combine together to build molecules, which combine together to build materials that we can see. The fact that matter is composed of atoms was speculated a long time ago. The Greeks spoke about it. They also speculated that there are some arrangements in which atoms are arranged. Now, the beginning of science, the science of the arrangement of atoms in matter, started in 1912 with an experiment by a German scientist named von Laue. He showed that indeed, as people thought before, atoms have a certain arrangement to them. That experiment that von Laue performed in 1912, the first time he performed it, and you shine a monochromatic, which means single wavelength of X-rays onto a specimen, and the atoms in the specimen diffract that beam to form a pattern behind the specimen or back reflection in the front of the specimen. That pattern, which is composed of dots or circles, tell you everything about the structure in which the atoms are arranged. He looked at crystals, and crystals mean, meant that atoms are arranged in a way which is periodic. Periodic is like tiles on the floor. When you know the order, you can speculate where the next tile will be. Even if you don't see it, you know that the next tile will be there, and the next one there, so you know you understand the order. And in ordered atoms, you can have several ways which you can rotate and have rotational symmetry. Rotational symmetry means the following. If you look at square tiles on the floor, and imagine that you turn it 
90 degrees and look again, you will not know that I turned it because it looks the same. 90 degrees again and 90 degrees. You can do it four times, one, two, three, four, and it comes back to the same position. This is called fourfold symmetry. Since 1912, up until 1982, when I performed my experiments, all the crystals were ordered, there was order to the atoms, and they were periodic. So the symmetries that are allowed in periodic systems are one, two, three, four, and six, no five, and nothing beyond six. And so, based on that, a paradigm grew. A paradigm was created. A paradigm is something that does not come from uh, theory, but comes from observations. And the paradigm was that crystals are older and periodic, no exception. And in 1982, I have found a crystal, and then several crystals, that were, that acted like every other crystal. I discovered it in the electron microscope. They created a sharp diffraction, like every other crystal, but it had five-fold rotational symmetry, which was forbidden by the paradigm, by the rules that the International Union of Crystallographers created. It was in the morning, I was alone in an electron microscope room looking at a new material that they just created, composed of aluminum and manganese. Right there, in the beginning of the morning, I looked at the material and it looked very strange to me. And I took a diffraction, an electron diffraction from that area that looked strange, and lo and behold, I see a diffraction pattern that has five-fold rotation symmetry. And that kind of diffraction is composed of spots. So you count the spots. And I counted, there were 10 spots. And I said, no, cannot be. And I count the other way, 10 spots. This cannot be. It implies five-fold relational symmetry. I look again, and I study a little bit, and then I said, I must, I must share it with somebody. I mean, this is an amazing thing. The work, by the way, was done at National Bureau of Standards, NBS, in Washington, where I spent my sabbatical. So I looked in the corridor, it's a very long corridor, I looked right, I looked left, there was nobody there, nobody to share with. So I went back to the microscope and spent the whole day performing experiments. Now, what I thought was that this is a periodic material, which is twinned. Twinned means that the atoms are arranged in such a way that they form a mirror image. One like this, and one like this, these are rows of atoms, are arranged such, in such a way that they form a mirror image of, of each other. And in between is a twin boundary. And I, so I looked for twins. I couldn't find them. <coughs> I make larger enlargements, larger and larger. I could not find any twins there. So I was convinced from the first minutes of my observations that we don't have twins there. So what is it if not twins? And then it took two years to decipher. Now this is the very important part. For a couple of years, I was alone. I was ridiculed. I was treated badly by my peers and my colleagues. And the head of my laboratory came to me and smiling sheepishly and he put a book on my desk. He said, Danny, why don't you read this and see that it is impossible what you are saying? And I said, you know, I teach this book. I don't need to read it. I know it's impossible, but here it is. This is something new. That person <coughs> expelled me from his group. He said, you are a disgrace to our group. I cannot bear this disgrace. And he asked me to leave the group. So I left the group. And he was a good friend of mine. I mean, but he could not he could not stand that people say that this nonsense comes from your group. This was the atmosphere. People not only did not believe in what I said, people were hostile. The community of non-believers was very large in the beginning. In fact, it included everybody. The leader of that group was Professor Linus Pauling, a two-time Nobel laureate. He was a very important figure and the idol of the American Capital Society, and to his last day, he was standing on stages and 
papers saying that Tammy Shachtman is talking nonsense. <coughs> Two years later, I came back to the Technion, and here I met uh, Professor Ilan Blech, who was the first person to believe in my observations, and we linked force, and he proposed a model, a physical model, you know, uh, that explains how these crystals could form. And the two of us sent a paper for publication in a journal called Journal of Applied Physics, and the paper was rejected uh, on the grounds that it will not interest the community of physicists. And so that summer of uh, 1984 now, I went back to NBS and met uh, another colleague of mine, uh, John Kahn, who is a chief scientist there, and he invited another scientist from France named Denis Gratias, and the four of us published another paper, which was published very quickly, and then hell broke loose because it did interest the community, and many scientists around the world started to uh, work on these materials, and they called me from around the world, I have it, I have it, I have it too. And so the community of believers grew slowly, the community of non-believers shrunk. The new form of matter, <coughs> which have different symmetries than known before, which is called quasi-periodic crystals, or in short, quasi-crystals, is accepted into the community of crystal. So the definition of crystal was broadened to include other crystals which were not known before. It is used as strengthening particles in a steel that needs to touch the human body, such as electric shavers, also surgical equipment. It is the best marriaging stainless steel available today in the world. Extremely strong steel, which can be hardened and amazing. And, it is, and its strength is based on quasi-periodic materials. Hey, if you're a scientist and believe in your results, then fight for them. Then fight for the truth, all right? Listen to others, but fight for what you believe in. And fight I did. And uh, the result was extremely good for many people, including me. That's it, uh, that's the end. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to stress one fact that Dan said, uh, which is something that might be in your life very easy. The paper that was very well written, uh, uh, the first one on journal applied easy was rejected, but not because it was wrong, but not interesting. Be very careful, because this is a standard uh, answer when an editor wants to dismiss your work just because he doesn't want to think about it, because it is too new or too different or just something which is against the paradigm, as he said. So I think uh, the the, the, the lecture was, uh, I mean, sufficiently clear, so let me conclude this uh, long uh, presentation now with uh, one uh, sentence from one of my favorite scientists. Now it is Max Planck, who was himself uh, uh, an innovator, something very new, terribly new, that he made uh, now 120 years ago. And he said exactly this, that a, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing the opponents, and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die, and the new generation <laughs> grows up and is familiar with it. This is unfortunately the truth. Uh, in my much smaller scale life, I went through similar things, so I've been a witness of this mentality, and this is just another <coughs> warning to sum up to the advices I gave you, that in addition to filling up uh, the CV and increased visibility, have a real very strong will if you want to become a scientist. It's not just because the, 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 the way to, to the becoming a professor or something is extremely long, but just because you will have a lot of fight against you, and then you will have to resist this. And then keep also, please, a positive and long-lasting lasting relation with the, your alma mater. In this case, we're talking of our school. This is another little piece of advice. Your former tutors can be very important for your life. So keep being in touch with them for the rest of your life. And that's it. Thank you. As I said, 
I will uh, uh, deposit the slides with all the attachment and uh, details uh, on the website of the school. So if you want to see all the details of how to become a professor or maybe better not, uh, you, you can find all the, uh, there. Okay. If you anyway. I, I will put also the, the record of your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> I have an observation sure, because sure, from I was from sure you had that this then we yeah. Plant, plant yeah. The yeah the observation is there is actually a more uh, let's say m average way to do learning from this lesson which is uh, try to do things that are on the paradigm and so you can publish a lot <laughs> and then you can do a career but maybe you will not be happy then not a good scientist. <laughs> and not a good scientist. <laughs> okay, now I really think Claudia is uh, calling to order. We need to proceed <laughs> with our schedule. And, no, uh, it's just the lunch. Absolutely, <laughs> you're absolutely right. So we have lunch in uh, room H1. Okay. And then the program continues. Huh? Okay. Then, yeah. Thank you.